Thank you so much and welcome everybody to this forum. This question, what can we learn from histories of reproduction and care in the global south? And how do these sexual politics? Reproduction has for a very long time been a central tenet of feminist theory. Scholars have documented how concerns over reproduction, birth, have lain at the very center of our investigations of queer, feminist, hetero. how care sits in the nexus of that. We are so fortunate to have here today three speakers who address this in their work. Divi Abana, care in South African research and gender, childhood and sexuality at UKZN. Natasha Erlang, a professor in the Department of Johannesburg whose work lies in the intersection of marriage, Christianity, gender, and sexuality, and who is just completing a book manuscript on that subject. And Nicole Bourbonnet, an associate professor of international history and politics and co-director of the Gender Center at the Graduate Institute of Development and International Studies in Geneva in Switzerland. She has been the recent author of Birth Control in the Decolonizing Caribbean. It is my great pleasure to welcome those speakers in that order to address us for about 10 minutes each today. Thank you so much. We will then open it up for a discussion and I'll be looking in the chat section and the question and answer to put questions to our speakers. Divya, I would like to welcome you to begin. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thanks to the organizing committee at BITS for inviting me to this session. I'm really delighted uh, to meet uh, old friends and colleagues, um, but also to talk about an issue which has real uh, particular relevance in the last month or so, if not more than uh, two decades in, in, in the running in relation to teenage pregnancy. Um, but with a particular focus on um, teenage fathers. So just most recently, the South Africa's um, uh, health department in the Gauteng province has uh, um, announced that there were more than 23,000 teenage pregnancies between April 220 and March 221. And 934 of the, of the girls that were pregnant were between the ages of 10 and 14 years of age. And 19,000 were delivered to those between the ages of 15 and 19. So the label of teen pregnancy is um, often uh, applied in kind of a blanket fashion to anything and everything that has to do only um, with, with teen pregnancy and teen parenthood. But in particular, the focus often falls rightfully on um, young girls. I want to change that around uh, in my 10 minute presentation by addressing um, work that we have been doing in the KwaZulu-Natal province of the country for the last decade or so on young fathers. And uh, I want to argue that um, uh, young fathers or teenage fathers are often missing, unacknowledged, and silenced in the literature on, on reproduction, on care, and, and, um, and the broader discussion around uh, teenage pregnancy. The, the fact that fathers matter is, is an obvious point. Uh, the, the State of the World's Fathers announced that the 2012 white paper on families uh, makes this very clear, although the missing dimension on, on teenage fathers is very clear. So, Involved fathers um, 
the debate is very, uh, there is actually no debate. Involved fathers are really important uh, for, um, for, for, for in terms of heterosexual relations, for women and girls, uh, as well as children to, to fulfill their full potential. Um, involved fathers also make for happier, happier men. Involved fathers um, actually uh, promote um, uh, violence and caring capacities, which is indeed an important area of, um, of, of teenage pregnancy in relation to care work. So there, so there's several other areas um, that uh, I could go into in terms of why fathers' involvement is really important. Um, but from our study, fathers, teenage fathers, do want to spend time with their children, notwithstanding the the, the common assumption and the dominant uh, stereotype around their recklessness, roughness, as well as irresponsibility. Rather, in the last decade, we have conducted um, qualitative studies with teenage fathers in and around uh, the province and found, uh, found the following. And I want to begin really with, with um, the, the, the punchline. And the punchline here is that um, teenage fathers in this province negotiate being and becoming a father in relation to um, customary practices that are particular to um, to the context. And these customary practices include in Shlaulo, which is uh, damages, as well as um, um, a payment for uh, causing damage in relation to the pregnancy, in relation to uh, breaking virginity, um, as well as um, uh, damages being, uh, that are levied in relation to Ilabolo. But of course, that all depends on the specific context of the teenage fathers. So in the first instance, the teenage fathers in this context, noting that they lack economic uh, power and in, re in relation to age inequalities, that their weakness is clearly around economic disadvantage and the inability to pay the damages that are required in order to ensure uh, access uh, to the child. But the punchline is this. In Shlaulo, the payment of damages may be restricted, but it is also an important cultural resource for teenage fathers to, to portray themselves as respectful of, responsive to, elders and kinship relations that bring families together when the call for Unshlaulo is made. Just a brief a description here. When, it, when, a, when a young teenage woman becomes pregnant, the family of the teenage girl um, uh, addresses the teenage father or the father's family in order to begin the process of negotiating in Shlaulo. The second punchline is the following, that teenage fathers, as stated, are negotiating in Shlawulo and cultural expectations around provider masculinity and the payment of damages in relation to cultural norms. But as we and other research in this country have found that when teenage mothers um, have children out of wedlock, kinship relations are, are, uh, are forged, suggesting how family bonds are significant despite the, the kind of structural inequalities and the particular um, poverty-stricken context within which they reside, that family bonds are consolidated, suggesting that being and becoming a teenage mother or a father is not an individual problem, but rather brings families uh, together, both maternal as well as paternal. And so the expectation and the performance of provider masculinity, particularly when these teenage fathers are unemployed, not in school or in school, and therefore um, uh, unable to meet the, the financial obligations and combined with uh, uh, residing in uh, poor families, 
the expectation and performance of provider masculinities seems to be quite at odds with the context that is supportive of uh, teenage pregnancy. So those are, 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 the, are my punchlines in relation to, to, to teenage fathers and the issue around negotiating access um, and negotiating cultural norms um, and um, uh, access to their, their, their child. They do want to be involved. Their involvement, however, is contained by these cultural pres pres prescriptions. So the um, inshlaulo, just to, to, to repeat, is a customary practice, which includes cash payment or um, uh, payment in the form of cattle. And it is tended by the father of the child to the mother's family for impregnating her outside of marriage. So teenage fathers have to contend with these customs which are grounded in high value placed on respect for elders and a high symbolic value also placed on virginity and the patriarchal legitimation surrounding the birth of the child. So defying these cultural obligations weakens the child's access to the father's lineage and ancestors and also prevents father's access to their children. Now, all of this is situated within the notion of, um, of care. So one of the arguments that I do make in this work is that in order to facilitate caring masculinities, we have to, at the same time, understand the particular local context within which care is negotiated and managed. So fathers who are excluded from, uh, 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 from or accessing their children certainly um, has impact upon the, the, the whole issue around fathers that matter and that involve fathers are really important both to the mother of the child as well as to the child's development. Um, some of the final comments that I want to make here is that um, the, the notion of fatherhood is linked intimately with the construction of masculinity as the construction of masculinity is deeply embedded with the construction of fatherhood. And this is not absent when, um, when young. Indeed, a key dimension that enters into this is the notion of age and how age inequalities, generational uh, context, kinship relations, as well as culture all forge together to provide a far more nuanced and complex account of what it means to care when you are a teenage father. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that presentation. And now we would very much like to move straight over to Natasha's and I'm saving up any possible questions for you, Divya. Thank you very much for opening it. And Natasha, over to you now. Thanks, I'm just uh, preparing a screen to share for you. I have uh, precisely two slides, everyone, um, before you start to worry about um, whether you're going to be drowning in a PowerPoint. Uh, it's good to be here with you today. And uh, thank you uh, to the Governing Intimacies Project, um, both for supporting the work that I've just finished um, and which is um, something that feeds directly into what Didi has just been talking about. Uh, it's a book manuscript um, called um, The Convening of Black Intimacy in Early 20th Century South Africa. And it will be due out next year sometime um, through a higher university press. But today I'm speaking about uh, uh, my new project, which has to do with um, a history of uh global the, the kind of the global politics of contraception in relation to Africa um uh, and this a paper is part of a larger project in which I consider how to think about a history of reproductive health birth control and family planning across 20th century Africa in a way which reflects on the differences across the continent 
from countries in the south, which have some of the highest recorded uses, uh, highest recorded use of contraceptives across the continent. Um, so I'm talking about Southern Africa here. Um, to the Indian Ocean Islands, there's a really interesting history of um, uh, modern contraception in Mauritius, for instance, um, which reflect the same to the differences that exist between neighboring countries in East and West Africa. Uh, and here uh, you only have to look at the history of um, modern contraception in Ghana versus Nigeria um, to see how different uh, this can be. So what do these histories say to global power inequalities and also to the continued and continuing salience of the relationship between power and sex? And I think um, yeah, Divya was talking about this as well in all that she was talking about um, the, you know, the relative power of young fathers, for instance, to be able to make decisions about um, uh, the roles they play in children's lives set against uh, a backdrop of custom, for instance. So feminist scholarship has long recognized that all citizenship is sexual citizenship. And as Laura Briggs, Raina Rapp and others have noticed in a variation on this, all politics is ultimately reproductive politics. Though what people might understand by the phrase reproductive politics varies greatly. Um, and that's, that's part of what we need to disentangle in uh, looking at 20th century and 21st century histories of contraception. For many feminist activists and academics, reproductive politics have, since the 1960s, centered on a woman's right to bodily integrity and choice in matters of reproduction. An inherently liberal view centered on the notion of individual rights. Um, and I think you can see from the slides uh, that I have, the slide I have on the screen, that a notion of individual rights in relation to contraception is just cut across at so many levels um, by um, the material, I'm talking literally about the material politics of the provision of reproductive, reproduction, because reproduction does not take place um, uh, only in relation to the body of one individual. Um, so, so this liberal view um, has persisted and still persists to dis to today, even despite the post-colonial and theoretical destabilization of the individual and Western subject in the 1990s, and critically also challenges from decolonial thinking uh, and some recent movements in relation, for instance, to um, Fees Must Fall and Me Too, both of which are actually global uh, movements. Uh, one, uh, a global movement um, uh, in its uh, iteration as Black Lives Matter. But these are only some of the views that exist currently in relation to reproductive politics. Uh, and in some senses, um, what both these views do is um, to disregard a larger community of thinking that exists in relation to the world of population demographics, um, and especially a whole swathe of donor organizations, mostly located in the West, and you know, uh, amongst all that's happened recently, one of the small things we can give thanks for is Biden's um, relaxing on the global gag rule. Um, but there, 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 there is a whole world of public health policy out there that is directly associated with the politics of reproduction, but yet which often gets disregarded when people start to think about reproduction. Um, in Nigeria, for instance, pro-natalist thinking and resistance to contraception echo many of the arguments made about the imposition of Western ideals about family planning in the global South. But these roots have their own complex uh, history in independence era national politics. And that helps to explain some of the differences that exist, for instance, between Ghana and Nigeria. The reason why today Nigeria has one of the lowest rates of contraceptive use on the continent reflects more than a relatively straightforward case of resistance to colonial oppression um, when not using contraceptives 
was equated with resistance to Western interference. And this is very much a language that you still see um, in Nigerian discussion about uh, family planning today. Um, uh, instead, if you really want to understand what was happening in Nigeria in the 1960s, you need to look at the complex uh, histories of ideas around uh, childbirth spacing. For instance, looking at someone like Caroline Bledsoe's work to understand um, the intricacies of what was going on there, as well as divisions between North Nigeria and South Nigeria and competition, I'm speaking very um, loosely here, between Islam and uh, Christianity. So if we remain with a line of thinking that views reproductive health only in relation to family planning um, and only in relation to Western aid driven family planning, we miss the complexity of significant variation as well as the extent to which ideas around contraception and reproductive rights are related to larger issues. Now, the, two, the slide that you see in front of you, I'm just going to speak to the two slides and then I'm done. Um, uh, gesture to some of what I'm thinking about. Both of them show, one is a much older poster, um, um, the one from Kenya. Um, it's uh, from the early 1980s and it's uh, uh, talking about the way in which family planning policies are often linked explicitly to the idea that family planning is something that happens within heterosexual families. Um, and in fact, I, I was listening to um, a very interesting podcast on um, family planning policies in India and the effect of COVID on, on the access to contraception last week, um, all of which assumed that family planning at the moment, and this is another point I'm going to make, is absent in relation to heterosexual families and rather than absent in relation to other categories of people who are having sex, who are trying to, uh, uh, to prevent birth. Um, so um, the thing that I've been thinking about recently, for instance, is injectables uh, and histories of injectables and things that need to be injected into you to have efficacy. So one of the interesting things, um, and I'm gonna just flip on to my next slide. There we go. Uh, okay, this is a quote um, from a South African report, and I'm sure many of you have encountered um, uh, similar stories in the last year or so. I have to say that I fortunately am not struggling to find contraception anymore, but I have spent a long time over the last year struggling to get my um, hormone, hormonal replacement therapy patches uh, filled in pharmacies because there's a global shortage of them. So at the moment, across the world, because of COVID, um, things like family planning services are under threat. They either are not available, they were particularly not available under hard lockdown, and the global supply and distribution of certain kinds of family planning are under threat for different reasons, one of which has to do with people's fear of injections. Now, this extends further into issues around public health, which have, for instance, to do with ideas about vaccination. Um, and I think that you can all fill in for yourselves uh, where some of my thinking may be going in trying to relate reproductive rights, not just to issues of women's bodily integrity, but to broader socio-global issues around how we understand the balance of power between the global north and the global south, access to healthcare more generally, um, the impact of pandemics like HIV AIDS in the 1990s, which affected family planning then, and also the impact that the current pandemic has had on access to things like family planning and contraception and safe family planning and contraception. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, that's the end. Thank you so much for that, Natasha. Um, and I'm sure that there are rich questions that people are storing up, provoked by those two slides and by the presentation. And now, can we move across to you, Nicole? Please. Sure. So thanks so much uh, again to both Kayo and, and Srila for the invitation and, and Catherine for the introduction. Uh, it's really interesting. Both of the both of the presentations were really interesting to listen to. Um, so my work as as kind of 
mentioned in the bio has shifted recently from looking specifically at the Caribbean context, uh, the English speaking Caribbean, Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados, to looking more broadly at transnational movements for family planning. Uh, a lot of this will really flow from, from what Natasha was, was just saying. So I'm looking now more at the records of these international organizations that Natasha was just talking about. So in particular, the archives of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, the Population Council, the Pathfinder Fund, the United Nations, all these international actors that really become prominent in the global family planning movement in the mid 20th century onwards. And in particular, I've been looking within these records at the diaries, the correspondence, and the internal reports of field workers. So these are doctors, nurses, social workers, volunteers, who essentially traveled around the world from the 1950s to 1980s, trying to spread this concept of the small family as the ideal, uh, as well as access to contraceptives, including in the 50s uh, and early 60s, the diaphragm and different types of spermicidal foams and powders, uh, as well as from the 1960s onwards, the pill, the IUD, and, and later these injectables as well. And what I thought I would just talk about kind of briefly here before we move into discussion are the different narratives that I see around the work of these international organizations. So on the one hand, uh, of course, in the popular sphere, as, as promoted by the organizations themselves, we see this narrative of, you know, kind of unbridled triumph. So the pioneering work of international activists who've contributed to the liberation of, of women from the burden of childbearing through access to modern contraceptives. And then on the other hand, we have, of course, these academic critiques that, that point to the colonial and racialized hierarchies of population and family planning movements, uh, in particular, the way they were influenced by eugenic ideas of, uh, and neo-Malthusian ideas about who should have children uh, and who should not, often kind of linking uncontrolled reproduction to threats to national development, to global security, um, in the Cold War, this kind of idea that women having too many children in the global south would lead to conflict and therefore communism. So a kind of direct uh, political, as, as Natasha was saying, these kind of deep politics of reproduction. Uh, I too have found the work of, of uh, Faye Ginsburg, Raina Rapp, really helpful in this. Um, they have this concept of stratified reproduction, which refers to the power relations by which some categories of people are empowered to nurture and reproduce while others are disempowered. And I think these historical narratives and these historical critiques help us to better understand these power relations uh, and the potential outcomes of labeling certain people's reproduction as threatening or, or unproductive or problematic. Uh, there are a plethora of historical examples of reproductive violence that have flowed from this panic to control population growth, uh, from the one-child policy in China to mass sterilizations in India during the emergency period, uh, but also to the kind of everyday violence that occurs in doctor's offices, you know, when men and women are shamed for their reproductive choices or pushed to adopt one method over another based on a kind of external idea of what's best for them. Uh, but I also sometimes feel, feel concerned about the way that these critiques, this narrative of critique of, of family planning movements uh, is also sometimes used as, as Natasha was mentioning, as a kind of uh, maybe even a conservative way to dismiss uh, contemporary demands for access to reproductive health services. So this narrative of birth control and abortion as being forms of Western imperialism has of course uh, really existed very, since these movements started. So from the 1950s, uh, 60s onwards. And this, of course, draws on very real histories of abuse and, and violence, as well as the continued racialized undertones of contemporary concerns surrounding population growth uh, that we see today. But what I do think this narrative kind of misses is the much longer history and, and more alternative forms of grassroots activism in favor of birth control, family planning, reproductive rights, or some kind of version of that that I would argue exists in pretty much every area of the world that um, the field workers that I've been looking at have, were came across. So I'm talking here not about you know, UN conferences on population or state family planning programs, but about Caribbean nurses who spontaneously started holding talks on sex education in the 1940s uh, in response to demands from mothers in their community. Uh, 
about doctors in Pakistan who provided birth control services out of their homes in the 1950s, long before the state became interested in population control. And also about you know, Catholic nuns in Venezuela who quietly advised women on where they could go to get an IUD, even in the 1970s after the Pope issued a Humana Vitae, which reaffirmed the church's opposition to artificial birth control. Are also these very interesting networks of men and women who have throughout history shared advice, shared resources with them, with each other, uh, creating networks that would sometimes allow them to help better navigate these state or international um, population programs or family planning programs. And sometimes in order to help them obtain access to contraceptives and at other times to warn them against projects that were more coercive or kind of domineering. And these stories appeared in the local archives that I consulted for my book, book on the Caribbean, uh, but they're also in a lot of other local and national studies and everywhere in the diaries of the international field workers that I've been studying for my present project. So although many of these field workers were themselves American or European women who saw themselves as kind of prophets for the cause of family planning, uh, their archives often tell a somewhat different story of an extensive, if loosely connected, prior base of activism surrounding reproductive control. So just for an example, to kind of get a scale of this, based on these records, I've so far identified over 1,000 local advocates from over 100 countries that I've been kind of actually tallying in a database uh, to think about this in, in something of a quantitative method um, uh, level as well. And in fact, uh, what's interesting is the, the diaries of these field workers, although they kind of go in with this idea of spreading the gospel of family planning, in fact, mostly what they do is identify people who are already interested and already working uh, in the field. And what they end up doing for the most part is just trying to get these actors to organize into a family planning association or some type of organization that would fit in with the norms required by Western donors. And I think we can definitely be critical of that process, you know, of the way that all these different kind of diverse forms of activism are pressured to fit into this one model of the Family Planning Association connected to the International Planned Parenthood Federation, following the same kind of rules and, and sort of in the end taking a model that may have worked in one context and trying to kind of push it uh, in another. But I do think that the idea that kind of birth control or efforts to mobilize around this altogether is, is Western really in the end kind of gives the West too much credit, uh, you know, for something that isn't their idea. And people everywhere throughout the 20th century have had their own reasons to be concerned about reproduction. Uh, and we're already mobilizing to do something about it long before uh, states or international donors became involved. And these records also show that people came to this work for a much wider range of reasons beyond the eugenic or neo-Malthusian fears of population growth that dominated, say, in a UN conference. Uh, for many, it was part of a larger humanitarian or maternal health project. Uh, many of these actors described their work as simply a response to their lived realities. So their experience of being doctors or nurses working with women who uh, were suffering you know, physical conditions due to repeated childbirth uh, or unwanted pregnancies, and some had direct experience themselves. Uh, many, interestingly, there's kind of this common dynamic among nurses, family planning nurses who talk about their mothers and their mothers' experiences with uncontrolled reproduction as being their motivator. Now, of course, these narratives are not as you know, benign or, or innocent as they may seem, uh, as Avishay Margalit has put it, caring may easily play out at the expense of respect for the other person's autonomy. So even if these nurses and doctors came from an, uh, a goal of relieving suffering, they might privilege their own understanding of what would relieve that suffering over that of the, of the person they were engaging with. And so I'm really interested in these kind of more subtle, subtle dynamics, kind of beyond the explicitly liberating versions of birth control or the obviously coercive. Uh, but rather these kind of subtle uh, dimensions between doctors and nurses or between partners that could make something either more or less liberating. And so what I'm interested, uh, then I, I think I'll just leave with a couple of questions that I'm interested in looking at rather than punchlines or, or arguments, because uh, I'm still kind of in the middle of it. Um, but I'm essentially interested in looking at this much wider diversity of forms that activism around birth control, family planning, reproduction, has taken, 
uh, what motivations and baggage these different projects have had, uh, what different visions of the ideal family have existed, and to what extent these were actually shared across borders, and how did these different projects intersect or clash with the ideas of states or kind of board directors of these international organizations and, and state population control programs. I'm also kind of interested to think about to what extent these earlier more grassroots uh, forms of mobilization were either kind of captured by state and international donors or on, on in other cases serve as a kind of precursor to the reproductive rights or reproductive justice movements uh, that we saw organized in the 1990s onward. And I think I'll stop there for now, but I'm of course happy to answer any questions and, and look forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. Thank you so much. I think those are three very rich presentations that uh, in a sense go from the global to the local and back again in these cycles and iterations. What I propose to do is to put to you a couple of questions that have been in the Q&A and in the chat and then look for hands as people sort of gather their thoughts. Um, I'd like to start actually with a question to Divya. We have uh, two questions in the question and answer, but I'd like to also add one that I think um, perhaps starts to link the three papers. Thank you so much, says uh, one of our colleagues joining us for this overview highlighting the presence of fathers and fathering children. The question is this, could you say a bit more about the non-teenage fathers and you know, how you think about their inclusion and exclusion, especially in relation to non-caring or caring? And who are the people fathering children with teenage mothers? Uh, what are the power dimensions there, especially in relation to, to men that are not teenagers themselves? And then the second one digs into your uh, analysis of the realm of culture. What are customary and legal practices, norms, expectations of other racial Kathy, your, your mic went soft again, so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. All right, I'll, is that okay? Sorry, sorry again. Okay, I'll keep yeah. holding the mic open. Sorry, I have to look away slightly to do that. So Divi, I think you... I would append one, which is on the issue analysis and I'm sure and I know from reading your work move between different concepts of culture and its boundaries but particularly because of the tricontinental frontier makeup of the region that you do your uh, detailed studies in be very interesting to find out how these forms in the face of consumerism school education So if you would respond to that, that would be really wonderful. And then I think before I ask the questions to the other two speakers, I'm just going to turn my camera off, but I'll be listening to you. So Dina first, please. Um, Kath, thanks so much. I, um, I would need to come back to you because your mic went off and we didn't uh, hear your, your question. I just heard something about... Uh, culture, boundaries, and consumerism. So let me go um, and answer almost immediately the question on non-teenage fathers. Um, and uh, this is um, the, the issue around father involvement uh, has been a, an ongoing discussion in this country for the last 15 years or so. Um, you know, uh, Morel and, and Linda Richter put up a book, um, uh, Barbers in 2006, um, and and this uh, this seemed to put uh, far, uh, non teenage fathers on, on on the agenda in relation to the need for their involvement as as well as questioning um, and providing a historical cultural and contextual analysis about um, and and I'm not going to say this although I'm now going to say it father absence because father absence is 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 positioned in in, in a in a deficit mode 
So the in 2012, the white paper on, on families addressed the issue of, um, of, of fathers and uh, called for um, uh, much more uh, support, research and debate around uh, father involvement in, in, in the lives of their children, noting, I mean, this is a, a variable statistic, about a third of, of black African children reside with, with, their, with their father. Um, so, so, so father involvement with their children in this country is, is far broader than just teenage fathers, as you kind of rightfully um, seem to get gauge, uh, or I seem to gauge from your question. The, um, the, the, the next issue that you raise is about the age of these fathers. And um, I, I began my uh, conversation with the, the recent um, outcry around the almost or over 23,000 um, teenage pregnancies registered in Gauteng province. And the same report indicates that they have a very little knowledge of who those fathers are and very few cases of uh, statutory rape being reported. Similarly, we, um, we, we, we are still trying to um, unravel who the fathers are. And um, in many cases, this is also a question of ethics, right? 10 to 14 year old girls who are having babies. Um, this is a clear case of, of, of statutory rape, especially if the father is two years and older. Uh, and I'm referring here to the Criminal Law and uh, Sexual Offences Act which specifies um, the age of consent in this country is 16, but the, the act allows for sexual relations um, amongst children between the ages of 12 and, and, and 15, 16, as long as the partner is no more than two years older. So a 12 year old is uh, legally entitled um, or without prosecution, fear of prosecution, to be engaging with the 14 year old in sexual activities. So the question of who these fathers are, I think requires far more interrogation uh, for us to understand the kind of power dynamics um, and what this entails. Because I also think that it will be wrong for us to assume that um, uh, despite the dominant rhetoric that uh, teenage mothers and or fathers don't have the sort of uh, resilience and the agency, as well as the ability, as I noted earlier, and kin kinship support to, to, to manage uh, the pregnancy. The second issue is around um, the customary practices and the different racialized groups. I think this is a really important question. And if I may just spend a minute or so trying to um, describe the difficulty in this sample of getting um, Indian and white teenage fathers. So the cohort, the current uh, cohort of teenage, of young fathers are between the ages of um, 15 and 19, and uh, nine of them, 21 of them, nine of them are colored. The, the, the balance of the, of the teenage fathers are black African. And in trying to access a sample that goes beyond the kind of dominant normative uh, constructions of uh, teenage fathers um, in relation to race, it proved a really difficult issue. This is not to say that white uh, teenage, we don't have white or Indian teenage fathers, but I think there are different dynamics that operate here. And without a proper evidence, I'm just speaking here, uh, you know, here off the cuff, or, or from other sort of research that, um, has pointed to the absence or the missing uh, dimensions of teenage fathers uh, in terms of a more comprehensive account. So I think many years ago, uh, Rachel Jukes and her collaborators, I think it was in 2002, elaborated on the issue around shame and, and religion and the ways in which these discourses um, uh, melded together to produce an environment where abortion, legal or not at the time, was um, was seen to be a way in which to, to, to manage uh, uh, mistimed, unwanted um, uh, pre teenage pregnancy. And this was especially the case in terms of Indian uh, families. So issues around you know, shame um, and, and the kind of dominant uh, cultural norms that, um, that prohibit um, 
sexual relations outside of marriage and combined with religion uh, produced a particular normative uh, environment. The, um, in relation to um, uh, uh, white uh, teenage fathers and this and, and again also I'm going to draw from the the colored uh, teenage fathers in in our cohort um, this one of the enduring patterns which has global and local um, manifestations is around a provider masculinity and notwithstanding the the kind of changing dynamics and the inability of of of, of, of these young men to provide by virtue of their age, as well as school going status, the, the, the ideal of uh, a provider masculinity looms very large. And this creates you know, serious constraints um, uh, upon their ability to uh, engage um, more, um, to engage with their children in ways that um, that, that resonate well with them and build up their own self-esteem. Because without providing, without being able to buy uh, nappies, for instance, these fathers do feel emasculated. So um, those are my responses to your questions. And um, uh, with regards to the issue around uh, race, ethnicity, class, these are certainly important dynamics um, and, and um, and cut through the experience of, 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 of uh, in, in our context, it's um, black African colored uh, teenage fathers, uh, Zulu ethnicity, and in the main, um, located within low income, uh, poverty stricken in some, uh, in many of the cases, but low, um, low middle income to low income context. So Kath, you Thank may you have so to much. I think I'll pull in some of the people from the media. I wanted to uh, put the next question Tasha, but this might also be a question that um, reflect on as well. And that is the question of injectable contraception and salience in the region over. And Rita asked the question about instead of the kind of fear of injectables, the efficacy and power over time, um, you know, to try and understand how that gets courses around anti-vaccination would be fascinating. So that comes from Anrita. And then we have two questions from Rishit that go both to Natasha and they are woven around the you know, complex double role organizations and NGOs, both local ones, expected spaces, such as the work of in the Catholic Church and national aid organizations and feminist groups. I wonder if both of you, and then Nicole could take that interesting question up. Thanks, Kath, and thanks for the question. Kath, I'm going to have to interpolate your questions because of your, um, uh, uh, this sounds terrible in the context of a, of, a, of a kind of feminist discussion, but of yours, your, your, uh, but, but of the, the, the technological wizardry of the West silence in you. Um, uh, that was a really interesting um, uh, uh, question. I'm flipping back to look at the Q&A about, um, uh, uh, from Amrita about Depot. Um, and the, the brief answer to that one is that um, you're quite right. There are there are many women um, uh, in probably in, strangely enough in South Africa itself, which has the strongest history of birth control in the region, which is to say the most has been written about it, mostly by people writing about population control or demographers. Um, including people like, I mean, a name that comes to mind is Tom Moultrie. Um, there isn't really um, any concerted historical work into uses of depot provera. Most of what we have is anecdotal. The concerted work on depot comes from Amy Kaler's work in Zimbabwe. And yes, women do like injectables and now the implants, 
because of the ability to hide their use of contraception from partners, particularly when they're in relationships where they don't agree with um, uh, what their partners have to say about um, having children and the numbers of having children. Um, in South Africa, uh, the anecdotal evidence, if I can put it that way, uh, um, and certainly there's quite a lot coming through from women's organizations that were working in the 1980s, points to the same thing that despite all the side effects of um, the perceived side effects of Deepa Provera, and they're definitely there, um, women were still choosing to take Deepa Provera because um, of um, the ability to control their own fertility. Um, uh, I see that um, Shireen Hassan uh, was on this call earlier. I'm not as sure she's still there. But Fatima Mia is one of the few people who's actually written about the way in which women in factory locations were forced to take by their employers Depot Provera to control their fertility. Um, uh, and then I'm just flipping. There's a lot more I could say about Depot. Um, uh, but one of the interesting things about Depot, and I'm not quite sure how location specific this is, has to do with um, certain theories of purity and danger um, and certain um, anthropological ways of understanding how substances are transmitted into the body. Um, so how people receive fluids and the degree to which um, the reception of fluids and the most um, obvious example here, um, although it's on a slightly different trajectory, is semen, so, so unprotected sex, um, without a condom, I mean. Um, uh, uh, ideas about fluids and bodies, um, and so injections have a particular history in programs of public health in South Africa that means that often people really, really, really don't like injections, although they are willing to put up with um, taking um, things like contraception or other forms of medicine as capsules or um, in other ways. Um, and I mean, one of the things that, that, that really needs to be looked at, and I'm so glad that Nicole was talking about this a bit, is also the use of IUDs and the provision of IUDs and, and, and the kind of um, pop, popularity is the incorrect word of um, older styles of non-hormonal contraception like IUDs versus um, styles of um, hormonal contraception. So, um, I think also, um, if, if I can look at um, Rashita's uh, comment, um, uh, the role of population organizations, I, I think, um, and, and, I've, and, and um, Nicole, I think you and I have been looking in similar archives, because when you look at the, um, let's say, the organizational, the institutional level literature, on the provision of family planning by large international uh, organizations, either the governmental organizations or the, the non-governmental organizations. The levels of what's happening at an institutional level is not necessarily translating to what individual workers are doing when they are driving around in their vans um, in the middle of nowhere um, with supplies of um, various sorts of, of contraception. Um, and there's, um, uh, uh, and, and, and what's interesting is if you look to some of the earlier stuff, like in the 1940s, 50s in, in Africa, before the push to um, uh, bring in hormonal contraceptions via foreign donor aid, um, there's a really interesting history of condom use and how people, before condoms, and this is not in South Africa, with its his strange history around fluids, um, uh, how, how people were really interested in condoms as a form of um, uh, family planning. Um, and so there, was a, there were like networks of pharmacies, certainly in West Africa, that were distributing uh, condoms, which they would receive from small organizations, Christian organizations, 
in London. So you can imagine the condoms go into the post uh, in the mail in London, and then they travel across uh, via steamer to somewhere on the West African coast and make their way. Uh, one of the popular chemists was someone called Whites um, in Nigeria, in Lagos. Um, and so there was a way in which uh, uh, local level organizations, not all of them feminist, um, um, but many of them actually on the ground, and especially um, organizations working for maternal health, which we might not, depending on how we want to think about this today, uh, consider as feminist. I'm saying that's, that's a debate for another day. Um, how, how those organizations were contributing to the rollout of ideas um, about the supply of choices to families in relation to how to limit or how to birth space children. Um, and let me give, I think, Nicole a chance to reply there as well. Thanks, these are all great questions. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the questions. I think building on what Natasha said about Deepo Provera, um, there's a really good book by Chikako Takeshita, which is on the global biopolitics of the IUD, uh, kind of building on, on what you were saying. And, and she draws on feminist science and technology studies as a framework. And she makes this argument that no contraceptive has any one meaning. Right, so the the meaning of Deepo Provera or the meaning of an IUD, whether it was something that could be beneficial or something that could be coercive, all depends on the social, cultural, economic, political context. Right, so Deepo Provera could be one thing to one person and and something entirely different to to another person. Right, and so the kind of I guess task of historians and anthropologists and sociologists is to find out the, you know to understand that context in which any given. I, uh, you know, uh, method is, is being used and understood. And then uh, maybe on the second question about this kind of, you know, the continued language of population uh, health, uh, in addition to uh, empowering women. Um, again, there's a, there's a good article by Amy Higgler where she talks about the negotiations for the Cairo, uh, Cairo consensus, which basically shifted the international language from one of population to one of reproductive rights. Um, and she talks about how there was this kind of split within women's movements, right? So some women's movements were really like, no, we can't talk about population anymore. It has to be about the woman at the center, beginning and end, right? Whereas others were like, okay, well, if we want this to gain any traction, we need to speak to the population communities and we need to speak to the, you know, environment communities and we need to try and kind of find a way, um, you know, to merge these, these different dynamics. Uh, one of the things I've been doing in my project is interviewing some of the women who were involved in the kind of lead up to Cairo. And, and again, you see this kind of split of whether we make this strategic decision, um, recognizing that states, uh, as it currently stands, are more interested in investing in something that has direct benefit to their economies or their vision of security. Uh, rather than, you know, making this more, maybe more pure argument on feminist grounds that then gains less ears. And, and I mean, being in Geneva, you know, the, the people that I talk to in the UN community or within uh, activist communities, again, there's kind of a split on that. Um, I'm not sure which is the best, you know, strategy to use uh, in the long term. Obviously, you make some sacrifices uh, either way. Obviously, the ideal would just be a world where feminist arguments were enough you know, to, to uh, obtain funding. Um, but I don't know if it's a coincidence that after the shift uh, to a reproductive rights language, funding for international family planning, population, reproductive health programs dramatically declined. So, you know, there is this, this kind of complexity that, uh, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. And I think um, I'm just re reading. <laughs> Yes, right, strange bed mites, exactly, Rashida. Yeah, this kind of uh, struggle. And, and in fact, if you read the Cairo Consensus now, it looks very much like a population document, but at the time it was very much seen as like this radical, you know, movement exactly. to reproductive rights. So, so there's oh, this kind of- Fascinating. Yeah. So one of the two, one of the things that I wanted to put to all of you was the question of joy paying attention. So what role does uh, acts of um, 
uh, and fertility control. How does pleasure and intimacy work together with technologies of preventing conception? Could include intentional conception uh, in the kind of project that um, that deals or it could focus on efforts at preventing conception. But I'm to see if the three is about intimacy and pleasure. Kathy, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm not sure if the panel could hear your question because the mic was breaking. So may I suggest if you could type it down and I would read it out loud. And in the meantime, I can uh, ask them a couple of questions, if that is all right. Um, I do, again, thank you so much for this amazing panel. I think all presentations were so, so engaging. And really, as Kathy mentions, there is, re there is a really interesting combination of local, regional, continental, and transnational linking in. And I wanted to push Natasha a little further when you say that a lot of this literature is about actually disentangling what reproduction means. And I was very interested in this, in this idea. And I wonder if in your research, you saw debates revolving reproduction that are really not actually about the biology of reproduction or the medical aspects of reproduction. And I will be very interested to hearing more about how this kind of medical debates tie into debates about, for instance, um, broader debates on motherhood, on uh, infant education, in the infant care, and, and things like that. So if that is something that you have seen. And to Nicole, again, this is such, such a fascinating case. And it seems to me that, that you speak a lot about these archives and about this figure, this kind of emerging figure of the field worker, the international civil servant, the development worker and, and all that. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about this figure, who were these people actually? And I will be very interested in hearing if this is a community that has changed over time and in what terms. I, I know from my, work, uh, my own work on the UNESCO archives that in the 50s, for instance, kind of 85% of the personnel were from England and France. And over time, there was a very big debate within the organization to quote unquote, decolonize this stuff, hiring more people from the global south, hiring more people with different kinds of exposures and experiences. And I wonder if that's something that you have witnessed as well in these organizations you're looking at. So, and then for Divya, quite quickly, you mentioned, uh, again, fascinating presentation. And you mentioned the issue of generation, the generational context. And I, I, and I wanted you to speak a little bit more about that in the sense that perhaps generation can, gives us, can give us a kind of insight into historical change. And I wonder if that is something that you are, that you are thinking through. I, I would love to hear about that. Thank you so much. So I'll give you uh, guys a, a, a few minutes to respond and then we'll go back to Kathy's uh, comment. Thank you so much. Perhaps we, we uh, Natasha, do you want to start? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly what I meant by that point as well. Um, so um, often what people understand, well, all of this is obviously historicized. So if I'm looking, let's say, um, across mostly but not entirely sub-Saharan Africa, because there's really interesting stuff that was happening in, in for instance, in, in Algeria um, and Egypt, um, uh, then what becomes clear is that depending on sort of when you're looking um, in a period, uh, 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 um, when you're looking in time, um, determines um, the way in which ideas about um, uh, reproduction are handled. 
And so sometimes, I mean, one of, so one, of, one of the overarching things, obviously, is that when people talk about reproduction, what they're talking about is, is not only biological reproduction, but they, they're talking about the reproduction of um, heterosexual cultures in the sense that, 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 that Berlant and Warner use the term. Um, and so often a lot of uh, what's directed at reproduction is directed at um, um, reproducing a certain kind of family. Uh, and then if you had to look at a hierarchy of um, uh, needs within the reproduction of that family, um, the least unproblematic unpro need would be maternal health, maternal and, and infant health. Um, and this is why, of course, so many organizations um, fed uh, uh, birth control um, assistance into um, local level scenarios across Africa via maternal and uh, health and infant mortality, um, uh, which is a much broader category, obviously, than, 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 than just um, birth control or, or family planning. Um, there, there, there are points as well um, at which reproduction is heavily tied into and for those of you who know um, uh, his work, this is obviously something that Matthew Connolly writes about, uh, where reproduction is tied into sustainability, where what people uh, mean is uh, reproduction in the context of a sustainable planet. And that links back to some of the questions that were, were asked earlier. So it, it, it's a kind of moving target. Um, and quite often, um, because it's so lost, because individual babies, babies that are born um, either from cesarean sections or out of vaginas um, uh, are, are, are so bodily, they get lost in all of the, um, or babies that don't get born, um, they get lost um, in all the detail um, that surrounds them about, you know, funding organizations trying to motivate um, for uh, sex education um, for schoolgirls as opposed just to married women. Um, and then briefly, there's a segue here into what Catherine was asking about. Catherine, no one, almost no one in this whole discussion who's talking about supplying um, family planning ever talks about people having fun when they're having sex. It just, it just doesn't happen. I mean, I'm, it, it certainly was happening um, and there's some really interesting stuff about this, um, more, a more contemporary look at this in some of Denima Potts' re recent work. Um, but you know, you never see the word orgasm mentioned anywhere. Um, so yeah, I think that's enough from me for the moment. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll follow that because I, um, it, it's true also I find in, you know, in most of the stuff I'm looking at where pleasure is this kind of missing link, right? And, and in, I think in the case of the international movement, at least that's quite deliberate because early on birth control was seen as this very like radical sexual libertarian uh, kind of movement in the 1920s and 30s. And so there was this deliberate effort to shift to the language of Planned Parenthood, family planning, to kind of soften this and make it appear less radical and more, more kind of moderate. But you do get pleasure coming up from the women themselves uh, in some of the, the records. So for example, uh, there's this great anecdote from a social worker in Bermuda where she talks about she was, you know, she was uh, telling women about birth control and, and all this kind of thing. And she said, she said to them, you know, just for an hour's pleasure, look at how much trouble it creates that you have all these children to look after. And then one of the women raised her hands and said, an hour, how do you make it last that long? The pleasure, you know, how do you make the pleasure last that long? And so, you know, I think, um, you know, and, and some women kind of are explicit in letters, for example, written to birth control clinics around the world where they'll say like, we're a young couple, we wanna be able to enjoy our married life. Um, how can we get access to methods? So pleasure is there, even if it's it's not being kind of explicitly talked about. Um, Kyle, to your question about field workers, it varies over time and also with organizations. So for example, the International Planned Parenthood Federation uh, is a federation. So some of the, the different kind of officers are from different areas of the world. 
Um, most of the early field workers are European and American women, uh, usually just volunteers, kind of women who have the means to, you know, go on trips and, and travel around the world kind of promoting this cause, um, but who often come from kind of maternal health backgrounds or, or something like that. Some feminist and some not, kind of coming back to Natasha's point, you know, uh, some more explicit, some, some more just kind of um, having a more kind of conservative maternalist perspective. Uh, in the population council, this becomes very heavily dominated by men. So I am looking at the records of one female doctor that are really interesting and her kind of experience within that. Uh, this becomes a big site of contention of the women's uh, health movement. So some of the, the secretary, Joan Dunlop of the population council eventually becomes the leader of the International Women's Health Coalition, partly based on her critique of, you know, this experience of hearing all these men talking about women as if they're like empty vessels and acceptors, you know, rather than than having being women uh, with their own opinions. But uh, for the most part in the early years, it is these kind of European and American women. But this, again, also also changes quite a bit over time and depends on the local level. So there's also regional, you know, officers for the IPPF who are from, you know, if they're a regional officer for Southeast Asia, they're from Southeast Asia IPPF. And this builds on those longer term networks that I was talking about of, of local actors. I'll just make one quick point about the question uh, about uh, the, the contraceptives kind of being provided, you know, products that are, are from the West and, and kind of reliant on Western companies uh, for this. And indeed, this is one of the big problems with a lot of the kind of more reliable methods or, or um, um, you know, more hormonal methods that are developed in the 1960s. Uh, the pill requires taking a pill every day. That's a very intense supply chain to maintain uh, and becomes a huge problem in a lot of places. The IUD, okay, you insert it and then you can leave it in for several years, but most of the IUDs from the late 50s, early 60s were a total disaster. Women had tons of side effects from them. Um, they had, you know, these people would kind of sweep into a village and insert a bunch of IUDs and then leave and women had no one to go to if they had problems or uh, didn't even know that they were necessarily going to have any side effects. So it could be quite scary or, or, you know, problematic. So they do, these methods do rely on, on quite a secure supply chain and, and health services to manage different side effects. Uh, so there was definitely a push even from early on to go to more simple kind of straightforward methods. I mean, the condom being kind of like the dream of contraceptions in that it's it's cheap, it's easily accessible, but then you have to trust men, which most family planning workers didn't, right? They saw women as the only responsible contraceptive users, which maybe comes back uh, to Divya's point about our ideas about masculinity and how those influenced really until the AIDS crisis made it impossible to avoid uh, condoms, influenced kind of what methods were, were put forward. Kathy, do you want to try to, to pose your question again? So the question around generation, oh. generational inequalities and what this does, I mean, if I, if I have to look at um, the, uh, the production of uh, young fathers as an assemblage, uh, a masculinity assemblage, then what's happening here is that certain, um, there are certain um, thoughts, ideas, feelings, uh, gendered discourses that are being ignited that will suggest to me a challenge to gener intergenerational relations and inequalities, but also uh, a reaffirming of them. So how, how does that happen? Or how does that manifest itself? Number one, when teenage fathers become, uh, when teenage fathers have a child, or being and becoming a teenage father, in a context of poverty, both challenges um, uh, generational relations, uh, challenges uh, uh, cultural norms, and of course leads to tension um, uh, uh, between the teenage father and kin kinship uh, relations. But at the same time, um, these also allow for different ways of relating them to the, the, uh, the, the teenage father. Once the child is born, kinship and uh, family bonds are, are reignited, creating new possibilities. 
so the so the so the, so the kind of constraints and the restrictions that were there are now set not they suddenly dissipate, so forming new sorts of relations. So my argument here is that um, intergenerational relations are both challenged in terms of teenagers, a teenage fathers having a child out of wedlock, when poor, out of school, or um, at a young age. But at the same time, by um, ref in, in terms of reference to the kind of dominant cultural norms, respect for, as well as obedience to uh, the, the norms in relation to payment of damages, it sort of resuscitates those um, uh, power inequalities. So it's quite a complex matter. And for me, it's more uh, a sort of push and a pull all the time. Kathy, go ahead. Speak, Kath. What I want to say, uh, which is perhaps on what Zizia commented upon, and uh, link that back to Nicole and also Natasha. One of the most striking things I feel about the region of Kosovo Natal, where you've done so much of your excellent research and your publications have emanated from there, is that there is this uh, a complex, I would call it, system or body of knowledge around sexuality, particularly fraught amongst younger people, that doesn't seem to be um, open to shift or change when so much else is shifting around young people. So certain kinds of scripts seem to remain and get validated and get accentuated and remade despite enormous flux. One example would be the high saturation of antiretroviral treatment and other kinds of pharmacological intervention, literally penetrations through the skin in that same region. In that area of the country, women for five generations have been involved in some way in the circuits of uh, hormonal contraceptives, particularly DEPO. And second of all, there's a very high monthly or daily use of tuberculosis prevention or treatment, uh, pre, uh, pre exposure prophylaxis, and then particularly ARBs. So, given that these very complex systems of interacting with biomedicine, with donor communities, with religious bodies, with schools, with other institutions, has been part of the world of the people that you are studying. How fascinating it is that condoms are almost absent as an area of care in sexual relations, especially since they are available widely and not costly. In other words, that you can also access condoms for free. And of course, I'm thinking about bags for Spinster and other people's work that you know of too, where an effort was made to locally produce female condoms, femidoms, uh, and have factories in the very region where you work, where, which is with local owners of the products and supply chains, which utterly failed. And the arguments being given that local people, particularly teenagers, do not want to use male or female condoms. So this was not pushed by donor agencies who said it would fail. It was an effort by local health-linked, human rights-linked entities with a lot of local stakeholders and it failed miserably. So I'd love to know why certain domains of sex, sexuality, and fertility behavior resist certain technologies in the same bodies and persons of people who are linked into and are giving some affiliation to other kinds of biotechnologies. And I suppose that links back also, of course, to Natasha and Nicole, because as you all know, Zimbabwe and Tanzania were just two countries in the world that refused to allow or permission Depo Provera because of all the reasons that people have set out. But recently, four years ago, they did a complete about face. And now Depo Provera has been rolled out by governments in both countries with their own supply chains, with community health workers uh, mobilizing the technology, uh, not nurses, not doctors, and not foreign donors, and paid for by the health budgets of both of those countries 
pregnant as they say, oh, and I hear that Rwanda is about to come on board as well. So I find that really fascinating, and that's a huge shift in the last four years. So those are just two questions, and that was what I was trying to explain a bit earlier, uh, Divya. So thanks for your patience, and Natasha, for your phone technology. Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, I'll ask the speakers to respond uh, briefly, if you can, um, and then we'll close the session. Thank you so much. Divya, do you want to go first? I'll, I'll hand that either to Natasha or Nicole to, 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 to answer. OK. Natasha, would you like to? Um, just to say uh, thank you, everyone, um, for a, a really stimulating um, discussion. I saw just um, uh, if I can apply to Justin briefly, um, if he's uh, still there, uh, your first question, the answer is complicated. It's both yes and no. Um, one of the things we haven't really talked about today are um, tradition, so-called traditional methods of, of um, birth control, for instance, um, uh, which are uh, one of which, of course, is, is, is abortion. Um, because we may think of it in terms of, of, of current debates around, you know, access to choice, but it has always been a, 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 a method of regulating um, uh, the number of children that people have, um, you know, likewise things like infanticide and those things um, um, still continue uh, in many places where there is lack of abscess, lack of abscess, what's that? Lack of access, sorry. To hormonal contraceptives. Um, and the other point that I wanted to make is that um, the other thing that you could probably where, where you can see the level of control better is in um, the supply, not so, not so much the international supply of hormonal contraceptives, but what's available. So whether it's Depot, whether it's Implanon, uh, whether you're offering some of the older um, um, tricyclic uh, um, birth control pills, so, so, so often it's a question of, of like um, what's available to be distributed. So once you go to the clinic, you don't have a choice about what you get at the, at, at the point of contact at the clinic. Um, but it's a, I think it, it's a really important question. Um, and just, just, I have to say this, sorry, the one thing I meant to say earlier is that um, in most places in the world, in a lot of places in the world, you can, you can, um, date what they call um, fertility transitions, transitions from higher rates of birth to lower rates of birth to well before the introduction of effective forms of contraception. So there's a whole nother nexus of stuff that needs to be teased out around the demographic um, transitions. But this was such a pleasure for me. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. Um, and I'm just so inspired to carry on with what I'm doing. And I'm sorry I talked too much. Thank you very much. Nicole, any final thoughts? Sure, I mean, maybe just to Catherine's last point about, about the ch kind of changing mania of Depo Provera. Again, I mean, also part of the, the kind of heavy critique of Depo Provera was linked to the particular historical context where it was uh, shipped out and used in con other countries, it was made by an American company, shipped out to other countries and used there before it was actually approved in the US. So that was part of the reason why Depot Provera was so controversial because it seemed like this very clear case of, you know, using something elsewhere that wasn't deemed safe at home. It subsequently was, was um, approved in the US and many of the safety concerns were, were kind of resolved. So partly that might be why it, it can have this kind of rebirth now in a, in a different way, although there are still problems. But, um, and maybe just one last point to, to what Natasha just said about the fertility transitions, which of course is really true that you don't need these extremely, you know, effective 99.9% .9 effective methods to have a population level um, fertility transition. Um, a, lo a lot of, uh, for example, one of the most widely spread methods beyond abortion is withdrawal, 
which of course is not 100% effective, but is is enough to create spacing that would you would see a population level. So there's kind of a difference between like what is contraception for? Is it for, you know, the certainty that's required, you know, for you to make kind of other decisions in your life? Is it about population level change? Um, yeah, it, it's it, it kind of comes to, down to the core of what we want from contraception and 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 how it's an individual and a population level issue. And also thank you very much uh, to, to everyone for your really interesting questions and, and uh, to my fellow panelists as well. Thank you, Nicole. Divya, any final thoughts? So I just wanna say that Kathleen's point about pleasure, um, if I can just hook on to that, really remains uh, vital in terms of how we confront the issue and uh, move forward in our research um, and interventions in terms of what young people want, what they do, um, and then how pleasure should feature so strongly in, in all facets of or, or all stages of life. Uh, even at young age, the fact that 10 to 14 year olds have had babies uh, suggests to me more than the kind of power dynamics. Uh, I mean, it certainly is a case that, 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 that is serious, but at the same time, the, the focus has been so much in this country on everything that is dangerous and diseased and damaged that we have in this relentless pursuit to end HIV, to end uh, you know, early childbearing, we have forgotten that the motivation for pleasure, uh, sex is motivated by pleasure to curiosity and young people um, you know, engage in, 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 in sexual activities precisely because of such curiosities and, the dis and in the pursuit of pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for this final comment. It's really so important. And I just want to thank the panel, three incredible presentations. They have given us so much to think about. So thank you, Natasha, Nicole, Devia for sharing your work. It's really, it was really a pleasure. And thank you, Kathy, for moderating the session and enduring despite all the technological difficulties. And again, thank you, our audience. And I just want to remind everyone that our next webinar is in two weeks, so September 15th. It will be on queer self-writing and representation. We'll have three amazing speakers, Gibson Kube, Di Marco, and Jamil Khan. So again, thank you so much for, for this webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye everyone.